Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education meeting here on Monday, April the 8th at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Uh, this meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topics to be addressed. These then can be placed in the basket over there at that far table on my right. I've allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. All right, we're going to start tonight off as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'd like to welcome the student council from El Sierra to help lead us. Please stand for the pledge. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. My name is Jackson Thomas and I am the president of El Sierra Student Council. I am joined by Lily Isaac, our vice president, and Bia Swears, our treasurer. Unfortunately, Addy Chomecki, our secretary, was not able to make it tonight. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to tell you about our school. We begin each year's student council with the election. We, along with other four candidates, give speeches to students in grades third through sixth. They voted and the four of us are very excited to be elected. El Sierra students really enjoy helping others. Earlier this year, we were sponsored, or we sponsored two different fish food drives. One in November helped stock the fish pantry for Thanksgiving, and we hosted our annual Super Bowl. Students brought in food donations and placed them in a box that supports their favorite team to win the Super Bowl. The Chiefs won the El, the El Sierra Super Bowl just like they won the real game. Between the two food drives, we donated 394 pounds of food to the Downers Grove Fish Pantry. One of the best things about being in student council is planning the spirit days. Some of our favorites so far this year have been Silly Hat and Hair Day, Dress Like Your Teacher Day, Rainbow Day, where each grade wears a different color, Multiples Day, Pajama Day, and Tie-Dye Tuesday. This year, we started a new voting program where each, the classrooms get to vote between two ideas for next month's spirit days. A special tradition we have at El Sierra is our Bobcat Friday. Two Fridays in a month, two Fridays a month, students are encouraged to wear their Bobcat gear or blue and yellow. We check in on each class to see which classroom had the most participation. That class, cl that class is announced at the end of the day, and it has the honor of displaying our Bobcat badge until the next winner is announced. We are also looking forward to our last Bobcat Day, and that's what we call the ultimate Bobcat test, or contest. Students get creative and show as much Bobcat spirit as they can. Two ultimate Bobcats then win a trophy, one in the primary grades and one in the intermediate grades. That's always a favorite in the Bobcat community. One last responsibility of the officers is to give an update at our monthly all-school assembly called the Bobcat Celebration. During much of the celebration, we updated s our, the school on our progress towards our 1,000, 100,000 minutes reading goal and reminded everyone to keep reading. Students at El Sierra did a great job and reached the goal. As you can tell, we are very proud of the work we do at El Sierra and even more proud of our school community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Katie and I are the PTA co-presidents at PT, or at El Sierra, and she is also the proud mother of. So. <laughs> um, so we started the year off with our uh, fun run, which I believe that's what that picture is. Um, and we raised a ton of money. We had a huge participation. You don't actually have to raise any funds to participate. We invite all of the students to come. And we not only had families participating, but also Mr. Lind was taped to a wall. <laughs> so everyone got a huge kick out of that. And that was the treasure trap. 
Um, if anyone wants photo evidence of Mr. Lynn, please let us know. I'll take that, Katie. Another very popular event with our families is our Freaky Friday, which you costumes optional. It brings in a ton of kids. We set up our very own haunted house on the stage, thanks to our amazing watchdogs. There's a line, it's a great time. Um, it's not only a way for our kids to socialize, but one of our big goals as the PTA is to build that community between our parents as well. When they feel connected to each other, they feel more connected to our school, which is a win-win situation, which also led to us our, our success with, do you wanna talk about donuts for? Sure, so we've had breakfast with Santa at the school for a very long time, and even during COVID, we had it outside and did a drive by Santa. We are very excited to bring it back fully this year, and we actually set up Santa on our stage, and he's one of the best Santas, I think, in the world. He's actually just the Santa. He is. He's awesome. <laughs> but um, we had a huge turnout, and we supported the new donut shop in downtown Downers. They provided all of the mini donuts for the kids, and we also had stations for them to do other activities, and really just enjoyed all of the together community um, for the first half of a Saturday. So, great turnout for it. And these are some photos from other events this year that we are particularly proud of. We do our art enrichment program, um, fun lunch. One of the most exciting things that's happening at El Sierra is fun lunch is for everyone. So instead of somebody forgetting to turn in the form or perhaps not being able to afford fun lunch that month, what our PTA did is stepped in and we pay for all the fun lunches. So fun lunch is actually fun for everyone and no one is left out. We've heard great feedback from our teachers there, students of course, but again, it's just making sure that we're providing equitable services to all of our students there. We've got some fun pictures from our ice cream social, getting parents in and volunteering with the different holiday um, celebrations that we have. And we are super proud that El Sierra was the home of the best costume for the reading level one um, with our um, older readers there. I forget their exact name. But they looked absolutely fantastic. And we are so proud to be part of that uh, PTA funded or programming um, reading games. Okay, and then Mr. Lynn started Watchdog, so I feel like he should. <laughs> yeah, we'll let him talk. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Brienne. Uh, one of the things we're really proud of at El Sierra is our Watchdogs program. Uh, we've had it for several years. Um, the program has grown so much. We're now instead of having <coughs> just one dad a week coming, we have two dads, um, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, every Wednesday of the school year. They volunteer um, to help out in all the different classrooms. And the idea behind it is getting that positive male role model um, in the building. Somebody besides just me is that positive role model, right? Uh, we have um, had a lot of good feedback from that. Uh, dads like it because they get a chance to really interact with a lot of the different grade levels, not just their own child's classroom. Um, the students love it because they get to find out the different types of things that our watchdogs do when they're not watchdogs too, like their careers and things like that. So it's been a real good program for us. The uh, next thing that we've had you know, traditionally at El Sierra is our school families program. Um, there's a picture of me with my school family from last year. And the, night, nice, the neat part about this program is that it's students kindergarten all the way through sixth grade as your school family. And like some of the other schools in the district that have this program, the nice part is you keep that family every year. So as your sixth graders turn into seventh graders, we write them letters um, while they're at middle school to you know, wish them well. And then we welcome in new kindergartners each year uh, to the program. Um, and every staff member in the building has their own school family, so it's a lot of fun for the kids to be able to do that. We do that once a month. One of the big things for us is you know, data, and with that is the IAR testing. It's one of those things where, as a school district, but really with our school specifically, we've been working at making sure that everybody has an equal playing field for the test. Um, and one of the things that we do for that is making sure that the students are familiar with the format of the test, my teacher's walking through, you know, this is what the test looks like, these are some of the things we've been studying this year, and these are some of the strategies that good test takers would do, really bring it down to the student level. We've also you know, taken it one step further with my newsletters by giving parents the opportunity to take a look at some of the practice tests that are available too, so families can you know, take a look at what their child's going to be interacting with with the IAR testing, and we've gotten some good feedback from parents 
because there's no longer a mystery about what that test might look like. Um, and as you can see, um, last year's results, we were in the expected growth area with our green dot right there. Um, you know, the interesting part right there is both for reading and math, or ELA and math, uh, we're at the positive 0.26 in growth effect size right there. So we're proud uh, with that as those results came in last year. And I can tell you right now, our students are working really hard on the IAR right now. And we are about halfway through our state testing. Uh, breaking down a little bit further, as we looked at our ELA scores from last year, these are the, from third to sixth grade, because those are the grade levels that participate in IAR. Um, you know, we saw a lot of positive growth within um, our sample size right there, which is exciting to be able to see. The part I want to, you know, kind of just point out with, within there, really for us is, you know, that expected growth, you know, piece right there, those high percents. The part that we continue um, to work at as a school is our percent meeting the benchmark. Um, that's the part where it's great to see high growth, but we also want to continue to see our students improving at meeting that benchmark um, overall. And that's one of the pieces um, that we continue to look at. And I'll get into that a little bit further with our school improvement plan in just a minute. When we take a look at mathematics um, for the IAR, you can see you know, very similar numbers there in terms of um, the expected you know, growth. Um, and then we're continuing to work at that percent of students meeting the benchmark. Um, so those are things where we can celebrate those um, accomplishments, but never resting because you know, I think as we start to close that gap of the percent meeting the benchmark, that's the part for us that we really look to celebrate in the future. We also take a look at our MAP data. Um, our students, as you guys know, uh, take this test three times a year. We'll have the next round of that coming up in May. So these results are from our winter when we took those in January and within that expected growth range as well this year, um, which is good for us to be able to see that middle point of the year is that temperature check, making sure that what we're doing uh, with our <coughs> school improvement plan and all the um, being aligned with our curriculum, that we're on the right track with that growth as well. Um, so we look forward to see what May will bring for the MAP tests. One of the things that um, a lot of the schools this year really have been working at is kind of how do we make their school improvement plan so that it's not just a document that you know, the school knows about, really so that our community can be aware of it. And one of the things that we've looked at is having this, these uh, graphics in our newsletter every single week so that parents know that this is what we're working on for reading, math, um, writing, and also for our social and emotional goals. I'm going to focus right now um, on our reading and math. Um, and my old eyes are having a hard time seeing that, so I'm going to open up this real quick right here. The, the part for us with our reading goal, we broke it into our intermediate and our primary um, parts of our school. So for our primary K-2, to two, really worked on those foundational skills. And that's been a continuing goal for us for the last few years. While we're seeing growth um, each year, we want to be sure that those foundational skills and those early literacy skills are things that we're continuing to focus on, um, not only just within our school, but as we work with our families too. A lot of the comments you know, that parents will have at parent-teacher conferences, what are some things that we can do at home to be able to support our students and for our primary student teachers to be able to talk through some of those foundational skills um, and the practice that they send home. Those are the things that are really helping us to see some of those growth areas. For our primary, sorry, for our intermediate school, part of our school, so third through sixth grade, we're looking at literary text um, and all those features that go along with what good readers do as they're looking through text. Um, those are things that we've been able to help focus, um, not only with the books that we're um, choosing for students to be able to check out in the library, but also with our read-alouds and things like that, so that it just continues to be reinforced. Um, with math this year, as we looked at our data last year as an instructional leadership team, we saw that problem solving, but specifically with word problems, is an area that we want our students to be able to get stronger and improve with. One of the things that, um, beyond what we're doing in the classroom, we also wanted to set up ways for all these things to be things that our families are a lot more um, in tune with. So every other month, we focused a month, as you see in the calendar there on the right, for September all the way through May. One month is reading, the next month is math, kind of moving back and forth with it. Last month, as our student council talked about, we had a focus with um, 
you know, reading. So we had a goal of reading 100,000 minutes for the month of March. Um, proud to say that our school was able to read 100,000 minutes over the month of March, including their spring break, and that put us over the top. So that was exciting, and we have an incentive week for them to be able to do some different fun things on the middle of April. Today at our um, Professional Learning Monday, our staff was working at coming up with different word problems and problem solving skills that our students will be able to do each week um, from the middle of April to the middle of May. Um, and there's some contests and incentives that the students have as they turn in those problems that they'll be working on. The idea behind it really was that it was a collaborative effort between the grade level teachers and our specialists so that it wasn't just these are the you know, four problems we want uh, coming from an instructional leadership team. Um, really getting that buy-in from our staff helps get the buy-in from the students and we promote it through our weekly newsletter and um, we've had a lot of families participating in our monthly events that we have um, and continuing with you know our reading night and math night those have been well attended the last few years too so all these things are really helping us improve our growth um, but our next real push is for us to um, really continue to work at that achievement piece for us too. So I'm proud of where we're at, um, but I'm also proud of where we're heading. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank our PTA presidents for presenting tonight too, and for our student council for doing a great job. And our student council um, sponsors that we have are Trish and Corsi and Chris Marquez, and they're doing a wonderful job with this group too. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Lynch. And for our student council members, we have some gifts for you today. Thank you so much for being here. Great job. All right, listed on tonight's agenda, there are uh, three communications. Are there any additional communications a board member would like to share at this time? All right, if not, we have two spotlights. Uh, we're going to start off with our first one here. Uh, it's a spotlight on our schools, the Education Foundation. I'd like to welcome Faith Bear. Good evening. Uh, I'm happy to be here again tonight and to share the work of this wonderful organization. Uh, there's a lot of excitement both about the past initiatives that have been going on and future plans. First off, I wanted to share some numbers with you. 22 years of making a difference for students and teachers and the entire District 58 community. Over 20 plus years, they've raised $2 million, and that's quite an accomplishment, and $100,000 most recently, um, and that's coming off the pandemic. There are six notable programs supporting students and staff. I'll go into those later, and there's four signature fundraisers. Um, but a number that I don't have up there is 100, and that's 100%. And the, the foundation really tries to reach 100% of the students, 100% of parents and staff in the District 58 community. Another important number is 13, and that's the board members. And there's plus six ex officio members, and Karat is one of those. Kevin and James are two ex officio members and two um, two principals and myself or Megan um, and they do the the hard work as volunteers uh, to run the foundation to plan these fundraisers and to uh, operate the the programs so I just wanted to thank them for their hard work that's it's it's a lot it's a lot of work okay I'm gonna go over some recent accomplishments uh, most recently they uh, created a, st a strategic plan um, some of their work is to rebrand the the website which they've done a lot of um, it's a beautiful website now it's very visual if you take a look at it um, in the last couple of years they've done a logo uh, redone their logo and you've seen that some behind the scenes work is establishing credit card donations for key events um, doesn't seem like a big deal but that really changed some of their practices they've also received their first corporate contribution so they're just growing uh, and they have always tried to, to grow and improve and uh, recreate and rebrand and to reimagine what they're doing. <clears throat> uh, so right now their future plans are to continue to enhance awareness of the foundation. Um, and second one is to increase the volunteer recruitment 
uh, there's a couple programs that really rely heavily on volunteers. One of that is Oktoberfest. As you can see from the pictures, and I don't think it's in this one, uh, with Oktoberfest, you'll see a lot of our staff members, and they form you know, a large number of the volunteers. So the, the foundation really wants to increase their volunteer recruitment. They want to increase funding for teacher grants, which they did this year. That's the highest number they've had, and also the highest number of actual grants that they have uh, provided. They want to fund future reading games at 100%, and they want to hold, or they are holding a new fundraiser in May. It's called Bougie Bingo, and it's May 3rd. <laughs> it's on Friday at the Moose Lodge. I hear tickets are going fast, and it should be, it should be a lot of fun. It's kind of a new, a new take on, uh, on bingo, kind of more a, a fancy bingo, <laughs> as we might call it. Um, I wanted to go over just a couple of the signature fundraising events that they have. One is Grove Express, which you know all about. It's the third year of teaming up with uh, uh, the Downers Grove Rotary and the Road Runners to organize the event. It's a, it's a tradition in Downers Grove, and it's had the largest turnout and the contribution for the foundation this year. And it's a, it's a very popular event. It's also a friend raising event for the foundation, uh, and just to help people make uh, become aware of the foundation. And Oktoberfest is another fundraising event and also a fun fundraiser. Um, it helps create awareness and it's really a community <coughs> celebration. Um, as you can see, it's, it, it's a lot of fun. They have some wonderful groups that come by. And they, in the strategic plan, they also talked about trying to um, look at improvements and reimagining what Oktoberfest would look like, look like, excuse me. They had their 10 year anniversary this year um, and again, it's a favorite fall tradition in downtown Downers Grove, and it's more than Downers Grove. I was I was walking to do my volunteer gig, and people were pouring off the train in their lederhosen and their their feather caps. So <laughs> it's it's more than just Downers Grove. So I also wanted to go over some of the student programs, the signature programs, and again, those uh, touch almost every student in the district. Um, Select 58, which is a recognition program for eighth graders who have distinguished themselves for their service, school, and community. That is coming up April 29th, um, and you will receive an invitation to that shortly. And then there's the sneak preview for seventh graders, <coughs> which gives them exactly what the name says, a peek into life as a middle schooler, and that's coming up in August. Again, that's really popular. And the reading games, which, as you know, that's a really fun event, an exciting competition for third through fifth graders. I'm sure you've seen all the pictures, and there's one up there of the, the first grade, or the first, the winning team. Um, and then there's Author, Author Fest, which the foundation does not organize, but which they sponsor and support. It's organized by the Downers Grove PTA Council, and that's the end of this month. And it's for first, third, and fifth graders, and that has three authors coming and visiting the schools. And it culminates in April 26 at Anderson's with a book, book signing. Um, and the student program is whether they're sponsored or organized by the foundation. The goal is to support the educational programs that enhance learning and spur innovation and support citizenship and school and community involvement and programs that are otherwise not funded by the foundation. I also wanted to go over the, some of the staff programs. Um, again, they're very popular. They've been around for a while. Um, they're successful and they reach all staff in District 58. There's the, uh, first I'll start with the Green Apple Awards. They're very successful. They're generally held two times a year during American Education Week and Teacher Appreciation Week. Anyone can contribute and honor a staff member and it serves as a key staff recognition program. It's also a fundraiser for the, for the foundation. Another recognition program is the Distinguished Service Award, and that will be May 15th, and we'll announce the nominees this week, so stay tuned for that. Um, and there'll be two winners. There'll be a staff winner and then a teacher winner that will be announced on May 15th in the morning. Um, the, another thing that the foundation supports is the new teacher luncheon and that is for all new faculty members and that's in August and it showcases the foundation and it welcomes and introduces uh, community partners to the new faculty members. And finally I wanted to mention the teacher grants and this year there's 35 grants that were provided to teachers that serve to enhance the educational opportunities for students. 
Um, and really, the, some of the grants really spur innovation. Some of them are used really as seed money, and the foundation is saw trends in some of those grants. I'm going to show you. I don't know if you can read all those. Uh, trends in some of those grants that might provide for larger programs for the district. Um, I'm not going to read all the names, but I wanted to highlight three grants. Each are worthy. All of them are worthy. And I just call attention to some examples. Um, one is Kindness Club by third grade teacher Christina Cardinal at Bel Air. Um, it's not a new concept, but the implementation of how she's planning it is new, and it's going to have impact on the entire Bel Air community. And it kind of takes takes off from the, the, um, the orange theory of uh, what we've done in the district. The second is World Music Drumming, and that's by Janet Hacked at O'Neill, and it exposes a lot of students to different cultures and wider music. The project is actually called Diversity, Respect, and Unity Through Music, or DRUM, and it brings the experience of drumming to the entire general music classroom and choir, and there'll be additional drums so all children, all children will have a drum to use. Uh, finally, there's um, Family Math Night at Indian Trail by Katie Herkes, and she has received this grant two years ago, and this is a new grant. It's, it's an expanded concept to sell math as a fun activity to the entire school community. So those are just three examples of these wonderful grants that the foundation provides for teachers. So I just wanted to leave you with this final quote. Um, at the heart of the foundation's mission is to support students and staff and foster creativity and critical thinking and curiosity and to recognize and honor staff and students. But really, as a public relations practitioner, it's much more than that. It's the foundation is an advocate for public education. It's really a vehicle for public relations and it's a communications vehicle for District 58. And it also levels the playing field, most importantly, for, and provides opportunities for kids. So on that note, let's see if anyone has any questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments? Thank you. We appreciate thank you. it. We have a second spotlight tonight. Um, it's our five-year financial plan, Todd Drapel. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> every spring, uh, the board the last five years uh, reviews and uh, approves the five-year financial plan. Uh, this is a the beginning or uh, a big chunk of our budgeting as we move into fiscal year 25. Uh, the goal on the plan, and I should say, prior to that five years, the, the district has done projections uh, looking at and using similar models. Uh, the format of having a formal approval process uh, allows the district to uh, focus resources and, and concentrate and work through ensuring that the board is approving um, uh, the format and how we are, are moving forward with um, with programming because uh, really it is it's about programming and planning uh, and working forward on, on allocating the resources uh, going forward so it's it's a model that we build so that when we start something we know we can support it on a long-term basis <coughs> We uh, actually have a, have a little new graph this year. Uh, it's actually the, the old graph uh, with the ending balance, um, but it has two other lines in there, the 50% uh, and the 35% line. Um, the red line is the f end ending fund balance for the end of the, each of the fiscal years. The two lines there are the 50% of expenditures and 35%. The board has, uh, last year approved a 35 percent fund balance policy so that we have resources available to meet the needs during that low cash period of time which is the time that we are entering into as we wait uh, spring tax money to come in uh, so it's kind of appropriate that we talk about it at this point because we're getting into that that time frame where um, you know, we come we come closer and closer as we're waiting for those those funds to come in uh, you can see during the the, uh, the the completed years are on an AFR or a um, modified accrual basis. Uh, however, uh, the out years are on a cash basis. That is the same format that the board sees every month in their year-to-date reports. Uh, that shows where we're at against budget and where we were 
uh, same time last year uh, in, in the trending that you have. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to take a point, uh, just one aside. Uh, there, this last year there's been new legislation that requires boards uh, to see year-to-date reports and some of this information uh, when budgets are presented and when tax levies are presented. As far as we know and as far as we believe, all of those reports that the board receives on a monthly basis uh, meet because you have a cash balance, you have a where you're at on budget, uh, and you have a list of expenditures and so forth, uh, meet those requirements, uh, as does this report and this, this project, as you know, what you see in the budget each year. During a COVID, uh, when expenditures dropped because of transportation costs went down, and then revenue the preceding year because the reimbursements were adjusted, uh, you see that fluctuation piece in that line, and then it kind of level out to that 35% piece. Uh, and that's where we're at uh, in maintaining and working to, um, to continually budget to make sure we are at or above that line on an annual basis. As with any project or any, uh, anything when we talk about resources and we're talking about budgeting, uh, we always start off and talk about mission um, and our guiding principles because that is what drives and what makes the decision making as to how the resources are, are allocated um, and how we, we, you know, where we're planning and spending and, and projecting. Some of the highlights, I, I talked about the 35%. Actually, it's, um, this says through three years, we literally, we, we look for three years this year, this budget, this plan has a four year that we are within that 35%. The last year of the plan uh, is not within the 35%, but as we know, five years out, things compound. We use the CPI as you know, a measure of inflation. We don't have contracts for staff out that long. Um, and for us to come in and arbitrarily reduce expenses to come within that, that framework without saying where they're coming from uh, is a little disingenuous, so we don't, you know, we don't do that. Um, every year we're looking to make sure you know, that we're balancing out those three to four year uh, time frames, that, that window. Um, and with anything with, with state, with uh, Education in the state of Illinois, you know, that, that last year tends to always drop off a bit because of that format. Um, staffing uh, of current programs and making sure there's an equity of, of class sizing per, uh, throughout the, the district and, and schools and, and how we balance those things uh, is a priority of the, of the plan. Uh, as well as we've included into this, um, we've not in the past, the, the capital is a capital report uh, that documents and has an estimate of expenditures for our capital planning for the next uh, four years. And uh, a chunk of that is, is some of the work that we have with the DCO grants, finishing up playground work, but obviously the majority of which is the capital work uh, that is going on um, from the referendum fund, the bond funds from the referendum approved in 22. Also in the plan it includes you know, a debt service, the increase in the debt service for those bonds to cover all of that work that is going on. Gonna, running through a quick couple of our assumptions, and I should say that the plan uh, is in the uh, board the document, it's a 22 page plan. This is just quickly the over an overview piece. Um, CPI is what, uh, how, our revenue is based on a good chunk of it for property taxes. Uh, it is always in arrears. So that CPI that for 2023 tax year um, is from the prior year. Um, the 3.4 CPI that is for the next tax year, 2024, payable in 25, was the, actually the change in the preceding December, in the, uh, December to December, December 22, December 23, and we get that information uh, in January of 24. So that it, 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 it's always a, a structure that uh, is always in arrears a bit. It's also um, a number that they, that now um, several of our uh, staffing uh, structures are based on is on the CPI, uh, which helps then uh, make sure the revenue is coming in house or is in house. As, as those staffings are adjusted. And it just, um, something we hadn't put in previously, 
It's been kind of make people aware, you know, we are a large employer in the area. Uh, we have 683 uh, full-time equivalent staff members uh, in the district. Uh, 422 of those are certified, uh, and then you have to break down accordingly. Also, uh, we included in this, um, in the plan and then in this, I mean, just kind of a breakdown of our uh, salary increase, or our salary costs. Obviously, being a service industry, the majority of our expenses are um, salary and benefits. Um, overall, you know, for 24, we're looking at 52, and we go up accordingly. Uh, for those areas that we have contracts, uh, those contracts are applied uh, for, those, um, for those years. Uh, and then we're looking at an inflationary number that we, that we grow with uh, for that format. Also, one of the items that uh, has come up over the years is uh, a replacement schedule for curriculum and for technology. So what we have built into this plan, uh, as well as in, you know, previous plans, is what is our replacement cycles? Uh, what's, when, when are we replacing curriculum you know, in, in that structure? Um, this uh, plan is unchanged from the prior year. Um, the technology update piece, uh, that is in there as well. That does have some adjustments as we go through, because I shouldn't say that. It has pieces, depending on some of that funding, comes from different areas. As we are in a capital plan, some of that technology update that deals with walls, the wiring, for example, in the board had a discussion last month where we were looking at contingency in the capital plan, the owner's contingency, to go in uh, and to use for uh, wiring replacement, network wiring, some of the funding coming from E-rate funding that's available to the district for that purpose, other funding coming from a referendum work to update 20-year-old wiring. Those items, uh, though they are in the plan for update, they're not necessarily an operational cost at this point in time. They're, they move over to the capital piece. It's one of the advantages of having a capital plan and having the availability of doing that work because those items are then available to be done uh, in accordance with the capital structure as uh, has been set up. So. <clears throat> Here you have a, a table of the capital plan and just kind of covering through. Um, it looks kind of onerous with the, do you see the, the large red negative numbers in the deficits? Uh, but that's because uh, the district did issuance uh, of the bond, of the initial issue uh, back in December of 22. Um, yeah, and that is the, the money that we are working on. You'll also see in there in fiscal year 26, in other financing resources, um, about a, a $54 million. That is the second issue that will come due that the district will, um, will need to do as the second uh, for those referendum bonds. Also a point out um, in the plan is what the district has talked about um, is a transfer, an annual transfer of funds from operational into capital so that once this capital work is completed in fiscal year 27, there is a balance in the capital fund um, to do this work and to have money on hand to cover a roof replacement or updates without having to go into another borrowing piece. It may be a district that it may make sense at one point to go into a bond issuance uh, in the future and, that, and, and the district has and we'll have a um, what's called a debt service extension base or uh, ability to uh, to issue debt without referendum um, and some of that will be paid down by then and, and have an ability to do so but for smaller projects uh, there'll be funds available in the capital fund we should also mention this is one of those we make the legal disclosure bond funds come first uh, because they're borrowed money uh, and they are tax exempt. Uh, they are governed by IRS rules. Uh, there is an interest, pay an arbitrage payment that comes due uh, with those at times. So those funds will be expended um, prior to the district going into and using unrestricted revenues, which will be local transfers or some of the other transfer of funds, um, uh, for example, the maintenance grant and so forth that 
we would be using and putting into uh, the capital fund to help cover some of those expenses. E-rate funds is also one of those examples. Hey, Todd, um, on that slide, I was just going to ask you a question about um, what, what state revenues does the district have available to it? You've listed there. What, what, are, what are the um, what sources of that? <clears throat> the state revenues, uh, mainly the, the maintenance grant, um, it, our plan is part of that transfer from operating is the maintenance grant that we will receive and you, you have in your year-to-date report uh, the 50000 we received for this year that we apply for um, then is a matching piece that the district has to do. We will transfer that into capital for the duration of this capital work. Um, the E-rate money, which is federal, that is helping to cover the expenses for wiring, uh, those funds would are, are, will be moved into the capital to help uh, because wiring, the updating and wiring is part of these, these plans. So like the project, I'm just looking at projected 25 um, state, you have $200,000 20, $200, of revenue. Oh, sorry, DCO, thank you. Uh, the DCO like money for still, the playground. Okay. Yeah, so that hasn't, yeah, we have not, we've not received all of the, the funds from last year and then we also have two projects that will be coming up for this next year. Right. So that's, that's the DCO funds that will be coming in and those are all capital projects. Um, and in some cases, the work from last summer will be paying us back for uh, the, local, the local resources that we've used in the capital fund for those. And Thank the you. reason there's Thank still you. some playground money available, if you remember, some schools had already spent uh, their PTA funds that they raised prior to the capital law being passed. And so they're now in their second phase of playground work. Um, Whittier and Highland are great examples of that this summer because they had already spent the money, the law got passed, gave them money, so now they're spending that money as it comes through. The only tricky part with the DCEO money is that they inform us um, sometimes in the spring, summer, or fall which projects they're funding for that particular fiscal year. So it's not like they have any rhyme or reason or, or order. It's just kind of they tell us and then we move forward with those projects as quickly as possible. It's also a different reporting structure and and to and expectation format for documents compared to what we are used to working with you know uh, just the state board of education they have a different standard and structure mm -hmm. so it takes a little bit more back and forth <clears throat> any uh, questions on capital the only thing I want to highlight, Todd, before we get into questions, I want to thank the members of the FAC, especially Member Olchek and uh, Board President Hughes. We meet monthly on Fridays, and uh, they really do pour over this information. They help us get to this point, and um, it's a committee that meets at 7 a.m., and oftentimes we conclude about 8.45, and so it's a pretty dedicated group. They give us a lot of good advice, and I want to thank them for all of the hard work that goes into uh, putting this plan together. The last table is the uh, ending fund balance table. Um, this essentially is the first graph in number form. Um, have the beginning balance, uh, and these are these are in a cash basis uh, format. Uh, where we're at, where we're our beginning balance and our ending balance, expenditure, so forth, and where we expect to be. And you can see on that bottom line where the fund balance is a percentage of expenditures, and that's where we're you know, looking to make sure we maintain that. 35% format, um, you know, planning for each year to end um, so that we, again, have the and, the, and the big piece, the reason for the policy is so that we have resources available essentially to pay the bills and to, to pay the staff uh, during the time when we're waiting for property taxes. I should add that piece because we just received our tentative information today for property taxes, uh, which is a week or two later than normal. Um, we do believe that this county, from what we understand, will have bills out in a normal format. Uh, they usually have them out by May 1st uh, for a June 1st deadline. Um, that may be, depending on circumstances, we don't know yet you know, if that will still, if they will still be able to match that. Uh, the assessment cycle drove a few extra weeks beyond or if it will be something that's that first, you know, five, so many days later. That could have an impact on 
where we end on a cash basis on June 30th, depending on when their distribution dates are. And, and it really is just about a, a time and calendar as to when the, the treasurer is able to distribute funds. It comes down to sometimes whether they make a uh, payment to us on June 30th or July 3rd uh, as to where we hit to that, that 50. Last year we ended up with 53% of um, taxes in, in the early spring with 47 falling in the, the next year. Um, we'll see what happens for this year as to how, we, how that goes. Other than that, um, that and obviously that you know the plan is um, as I said it has a little more detail in the book. Uh, we just want to kind of quickly go through this. Uh, this is something obviously the board has seen previously, um, and it's a format that we've uh, we've continued to, uh, to work on for and use uh, in many years. This will be also the plan that we use to build uh, the fiscal year 25 budget that the board will ultimately approve in, uh, in September. Thank you very much, Todd. Um, this is all something that I know you guys have been seeing for the last couple months and it's kind of a continuous thing, but it is on the agenda. Later on tonight we are approving this, so uh, if there's any uh, questions or comments that you have at this time and just want to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to really digest since we have a lot going on with the capital funds and the referendum projects and and everything else anything thank you all right appreciate it thank you, Tom. all right that brings us to the reports of the board we're gonna go ahead and start off with the superintendent report that it's you dr. Riss. Thank you. Uh, under personnel this evening, uh, the board will be asked to approve a reduction in force resolution, also known as a RIF. Uh, the RIF process happens annually because we allocate staff members based on actual student enrollment and because we do not yet have confirmed enrollment numbers in all of our buildings and programs, we cannot guarantee positions to all of those staff members. There's a detailed process that Justin described at the last meeting in line with the para legislation in Senate Bill 7 that we go through to ensure uh, that we are aligning to the law and no longer using a system of uh, first in, um, first out, uh, or excuse me, last in, first out. We're working diligently to confirm enrollment and staffing for next year and appreciate uh, the efforts of our families to complete the registration process. As soon as we get those numbers confirmed, we will immediately come back to the board and I recommend uh, to rehire uh, those staff members. Um, so we do not want to drag this along. We are asking our families to complete the registration process. That window um, closes today. So we would uh, really ask parents to go ahead and fill those out so that we can go ahead and finalize our staffing numbers for next school year. In terms of curriculum and instruction, state testing is going well across all the buildings. Any technical issues experienced were resolved as quickly as possible and definitely were in the norm of what we experience in a typical year. Overall testing has run smoothly with little disruption. Students are engaged in the process as you heard from Principal Lind earlier and we're seeing uh, minimal refusals across the district. We know several years ago that was a problem that really skewed our scores and we're not seeing that uh, this year which is always a good thing. Uh, data from the IAR will help principals and instructional leadership teams set their school improvement goals. We will get that data back and it will likely be released that last week in October is when we will then um, present that data to the school board of courses um, administrators we get embargo data that we can't share out publicly but we hope to get that back in June so we can immediately start using that internally for our um, planning purposes at the May board meeting the district will seek board approval to renew our physical education waiver uh, that is due this year um, so we have to uh, go through that because we don't have daily PE at the elementary level. Uh, this allows students in kindergarten through second grade to participate in PE two days a week with, a with additional teacher monitor uh, recess uh, to meet those times. And the other waiver uh, that we will be discussing at the May uh, board meeting uh, will also be, we'll begin the process of the e-learning uh, that we'll continue to talk about. In terms of Todd, there won't be a finance report because Todd just gave his, um, but technology, uh, the technology department continues working with families and school offices to support registration. We've reached the registration deadline as I just shared. School offices will begin contacting now families that haven't completed the registration process. So we will then contact them to make sure that we get those uh, numbers in. In addition, the technology team has been working to ensure that testing goes as smoothly as possible. So we want to thank James and his entire team for their uh, efforts. 
For special services, the Special Services Department of Building Bridges are collaborating to offer families of students with special needs uh, the chance to explore funding options available through the state PUNS system, which is prioritization of urgent needs for services in Illinois. Uh, we want to help families discover firsthand how a local parent navigated the state system to secure funding for various services for her disabled uh, child. Session times and locations can be found in your weekly uh, principal letter uh, that comes out on the weekends. We urge everyone to consider participating in this opportunity to expand their knowledge regarding additional resources available for their child. In terms of facilities, uh, a quick construction update. While construction has started at both middle schools, the wet week last week slowed the progress at Herrick. If you've been by Saratoga Avenue, you know, they're digging out the back field there, and whenever you have that much rain, it, it's a struggle. Uh, but they were really working hard today. Uh, however, O'Neill is moving forward with substantial interior demolition, and today we had exterior demolition. Uh, the small gym at O'Neill is now a thing of the past. They really made some good work today. Uh, phase one elementary school planning continues as we near summer and phase two design work has already begun. Our construction manager, uh, they're here this evening, Billy and Andrews, held their first middle school neighborhood meeting and the dashboard options are becoming live such as the webcam and drone flight so you can take a look at that. I also want to thank our um, owner's representative Huffman and Keel who's also here tonight uh, to assist us. Uh, we have also received a few emails from Commonwealth Edison uh, recently acknowledging our need and construction schedule, which has uh, been an increase in confidence from recent interactions. So we finally heard back from ComEd. They've also agreed to meet virtually this week about each school project to coordinate the exchange of information. While we still have some concerns on their timeline, uh, it was good overall that they actually contacted <laughs> us back. Uh, so that has been something that we've really been worrying about. I want to thank Kevin Bardo for his persistence and really making sure um, that we get a hold of ComEd and that they continue to uh, work with us. Uh, there will be no public relations update this evening uh, because Faith just gave her Education Foundation uh, support. And to conclude, on a personal note, many of you are aware that my wife recently lost her battle with cancer, and I just want to um, publicly thank everyone for their support, the board, my administrative colleagues, um, the wonderful staff, and our families. Um, I will never forget, my family won't forget the support that you've given us and the continued support that you uh, continue to give. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Any questions or comments? Okay, that moves us to the monthly business and the treasurer's report. Welcome back, Todd. Okay. <laughs> I'll be quick. <clears throat> In the year-to-date report, um, I don't think I have a whole lot uh, to report on that other than, you know, the one area we, we discussed at the FAC meeting that uh, is transportation, you'll see, is a significantly higher than uh, previously, and it, it runs a little bit. We have at, the time, at times had uh, transportation firms who may run 30, 60 days behind in billing. Um, they've caught that up uh, this year, so you'll see a larger increase in, in that piece. But we've also had a larger increase in, in, in transportation. We've had a significant um, uh, increase in um, the sh cost share agreements that we have with other uh, districts where it, you have a homeless student either coming in that lives outside of the district coming uh, to Downers Grove or lives in Downers Grove and is going out to another, uh, another place. Um, the cost share agreement format is that uh, 50, it's a 50-50 split between the two school districts. And that has been, had a significant increase uh, this year over previous years um, just by the number of agreements that we have outstanding. Uh, we have, we, do, we did keep up, catch up on our billing uh, for all of those and have that. And so we are starting to receive revenue for those districts who are, who we're transporting to um, and we, you know, continually keep up with the um, paying out uh, our half of other transportation costs. So that is a piece, and it's something we're watching and, and looking for. I add that piece also because on this uh, monthly, on this report or on this uh, board packet, you have the two contracts for transportation, both regular home to school and special ed. Uh, one at 6.8 for home to school for first student and one at 6% for, for, for Sunrise uh, for special ed. Uh, we have um, a, we work with 
district 99 and 68 on the first student contract that helps us keep our rates down uh, as far as our overall route costs because we do double and triple uh, tiering a, 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 as much as possible uh, and that helps uh, one employs people for longer so it's easier for them to find uh, staff but also keeps the rates down because they're able to turn buses around and so forth so uh, that's that's on there we will have to bid there's a new uh, legislation that's passed this last year we will put that out have to put that out to bid next year um, sunrise is our special ed transportation firm uh, we left the existing firm with the SASID cooperative several years ago um, ahead of the rest of SASID and we went with Sunrise they then turned around the next year and went with Sunrise we will be working with that cooperative uh, this next year to look at what might be advantageous for us to go back and rejoin because we will have to bid out uh, special ed transportation and so there's some opportunities there that may save us some some funds on that piece so those are those two pieces but you do have um, increases in transportation costs that is something we're looking at obviously it's in the plan and we're looking forward to what those costs are um, it is a it is a growing expense um, you can see that we're you know we're going to be north of uh, probably all, all of that 5.6 million dollars that is budgeted in transportation uh, other than that um, the only other thing I have we have on the on the con on the approval tonight is for electric rates our contract that we have set uh, with Vanguard is due at the uh, contract expires in June and though we are on a month to month right now because the, or we're moving on a month to month right now because future rates are higher than current uh, market um, it's good to have that in place uh, to kind of help keep barriers and if in an event that you know the, the rates uh, come down and we want to buy uh, portion futures we're able to do that uh, down the road and allows for us to have access to that other than that um, I, I don't have anything else there's questions thank you uh, questions or comments thank you very much all right that brings us to committees uh, policy committee has not met neither has the legislative committee the Financial Advisory Committee did meet on April the 5th. Um, the, our, our main agenda was the year-to-date report, the transportation rates, the electric rates, the construction updates, the and then our discussion points with a five-year plan and a food service contract. So just to kind of reiterate real quick what, what Todd mentioned on that year-to-date report, we are seeing that spike in transportation. A couple years back, we did have a talk about the impact of some of the work that was being done in the local hotels including the turnover of the Red Roof Inn that exists over there on Butterfield Road uh, it, it that ha that takes a little bit of time to start catching up I expense wise because that is temporary housing so once they've established um, not residency here but established being educated here in, in Downers Grove they are eligible to come back regardless of where they live so um, those are the services that we're going to continue to see uh, become an expense inside transportation and that's not as clean or as simple as traditional busing it there you know there's specialty type cab services and stuff like that and we are splitting <coughs> that with so whatever district they may live in that district would fund half of that and we would fund the other half of it and it can go the other way as well should they live here but they want to continue going to school in Naperville or somewhere else it would be our, our our job to fund half of that so we did spend a little bit of time talking about that as well as the transportation rates uh, we're these are one year we will be doing it uh, again next year we'll be going out for a full bid the law has changed I think I mentioned that at the last meeting that the law has changed so we have to go out for a formal bid um, at certain increments so that's coming up next year we are looking forward to partnering back up with SASET hopefully that can help save us some money in the same way that we save money by partnering with 99 and 68 the electric rates he just spoke about but we do norm in the past we've been very lucky with buying futures we can't do that right now but we'll keep an eye on it and everyone is up to date on construction so we spent some time talking about the five-year plan uh, we just saw that here today and then we spent a chunk of our time really talking about the food service contract uh, in general there is a memo hopefully everyone's had an opportunity to see that inside the uh, board packet 
Uh, but to give you a brief synopsis of the discussion that we had, when we initially started talking about implementing hot lunch at the elementary schools, uh, the thought was that it would happen uh, during phase three of the project. However, as we were moving along, we thought there might be some cost savings and there might be some opportunity to make this happen quicker and then get onto the National School Lunch Program. And so there was this desire really to hit fall of 25. And we had blocked out around three quarters of a million dollars, $750,000 was sort of put as a, a, a marker in there of what we thought that might cost for us. Uh, as we've taken some time to delve into that a little bit further, the teams have been looking at it. That number has nearly doubled at over 1.4 million. And some of that is, be is also coming into play because moving quickly, it's hard to decipher exactly what we need in those kitchens to meet um, with the county and the health department and everybody else. Things like, do we require um, grease traps instead of our kitchens because if they're not technically a kitchen they're just a warming facility there's different rules but because we're not necessarily far enough along those numbers could vary widely and we might have to do work that potentially is beyond what we'll actually need in scope in the long run so we started looking at what would be the impact of potentially doing that now or waiting and the concern is if we're looking at around a 1.4 million dollar investment right now that would be coming out of contingency, or at least a huge portion of that would. So there's a concern in dipping too much more into our contingency plan before we've actually opened any walls, though technically I guess we've knocked down some walls today. <laughs> <laughs> but, but obviously we haven't gotten that, that much feedback from that yet. So really the administration, in, it, working alongside um, with Bully Andrews and Huffman and Keel, have come along with a recommendation of pushing this back because we'd have to make a decision by next meeting if we wanted to go out to bid this to have that timeline work out and not have it be too accelerated. So if you look at that memo, there's sort of a, a timeline that we recommend. We really recommend coming back before next fall uh, with a recommendation to go out to bid and doing that in the fall of 26 would be when that would open up. In the meantime, we would continue to run status quo similar to what we're doing now to provide some lunch to our, our, our grade schools that would be off the National School Lunch Program. Uh, so that would be the, the timeline that we'd be working off of. And one of the, the things that we talked about in the FAC uh, with Steve's leadership was really getting a full out timeline of the aspects of what we can see and what we're gonna be reviewing over the next couple of months so that this entire board, uh, as well as the FAC and the administration can have all those th those pieces of information with plenty of time to be able to make that decision just since this is a shift in the way that we've done things um, in the past. So the recommendation at this point is not gonna be to, uh, to take up that as, a, uh, as an action item next month to go out to bid to do all the kitchen work in all three phases of the buildings. One of the questions I asked was, you know, kind of like we talked about with the wiring, right? If you're opening up walls and you're doing that work, sometimes there's value in getting it done in advance. And the argument that I made coming out of FAC when we did those contingency work at the last meeting was we would have to redo a lot of things if we did this later. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. So I, I asked that same question. And the risk that we'd be taking is with some of the things that we'd have to be reopening would be at about $15,000 a school or about $60,000 total. And when we're talking about over $1.4 million potentially in work here, going into the contingency plan, it felt safer to me personally, and I know to the administration, though I can let Steve speak for himself, to punt that to the fall of, of 26. So I open this part of the meeting, uh, though I'm gonna go to Steve here first, uh, to see if he has any points that he wants to add, but then I'll open it up for questioning amongst uh, the board. So I have a better idea if I should be looking at trying to get something to move in May, or if we'd want to hold out to the fall. But Steve. Oh, I, as always, you always have a great uh, summary of, <laughs> of those discussions, so I, I usually don't have anything to say. But I, I think, uh, yeah, if you look at it in terms of just dollars, it, it always makes sense to hold off, right? We don't want any surprises, but I think one of the things that we discussed on Friday is not letting a committee like FAC kind of um, 
have to make a decision without complete information at that point in time. So I, I kind of challenged the administration that I think we had enough time to kind of present some of this information a little bit sooner. Um, but I think, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. but, um, you know, I, the reality is it's 2024 and we don't have hot lunch in Downers Grove. And to me, like, I, I feel like that's a huge gap um, and waiting another two years for something that um, could be done sooner. I, you know, that doesn't sit well with me, but I understand the financial considerations and we don't want to have the risk of dipping more into our contingency funds than we're all comfortable with. But so um, I think it makes sense, um, but I, I, I don't want committees like FAC to kind of be presented um, half-baked information and be forced to make a decision based on a timeline. Um, so that was kind of my um, takeaway from Friday, but I, I appreciate your uh, your summary and Todd, I, I appreciate the, the dialogue and, and Justin um, was part of that discussion as well. So I think um, it was healthy dialogue, but I, it's still waiting another two years for, for hot lunch in a community like Downers Grove that just received a lot of money um, doesn't sit well with me. And so that's kind of my, my position, but I understand. I also think, Steve, that um, the constructive criticism was, was fair. Um, and um, we've had some dialogues um, in the last two days since I've been back about, um, in, in I own some of this as well, about you know announcing things too quick before you have all the information. That, that's one thing. But also, um, you know, how can we use that time when we're meeting with the FAC to give them all the information so they're not making decisions based off of, you know, maybe 50% of the information or 75% of the information. So we appreciate both of your work on that and um, the feedback that we've gotten and, and know that we um, have had internal conversations about how do we avoid getting to a point like we were at on Friday um, with maybe not having all that information and then having to backtrack some of our previous communication. When we communicate things out to the community, we want to make sure that we get it right or hold any communication before we make promises that maybe we can't deliver. And so um, thank you for that feedback and, and know that um, we will continue to um, work on that as we move forward. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, is Please. there an in-between on this one where the schools are going in under construction this coming summer? where you have an opportunity to retrofit, late, right? So instead of having to reopen walls, at some point, the goal is to try to get hot lunch, mm -hmm. right? And we know that. So is there an in-between between full and final complete lunch spaces and basically plumbed in, ready to finish, so that it's a lesser cost? Is there, has there been an analysis on, is there a lesser cost in doing it halfway to get ready for a potential full, even if you'd wind up not finishing that, you know, two years down the line, it's in the schools in existence. So my initial dialogues that we had was no, that wasn't the case because of that differential I was talking about, about 15,000. Some of that's electrical, but some of that is stuff that has to sort of get hashed out in uh, design and we're not quite ready there yet in the, in the work that we have to do with other agencies, but I can let uh, either uh, Kevin, I don't know if, if you or Kevin Bardo wants to, to talk a little bit um, okay. further to that. I just had to get you the microphone. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> my golden yeah, good I, Who needs March Madness? Right? Yeah. <laughs> just noting. Just noting for my exactly. own personal standing. Nobody tell me the score, please. <laughs> I'm going to fast forward. And watch it. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. No, no worries. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so one thing we talked about, uh, just as an example, is like... Uh, a room at Highland, right? So right now that's a champion storeroom that we're potentially targeting for food service down the road. So to answer member Ellis's question, so we wouldn't want to go in there with a bunch of equipment and everything, not knowing our future lunch program oh, yeah. format. But what we do know is like the electrical service is capable of bringing on this food service program. The plumbing's capable of bringing it on. We just don't want to go into those spaces yet and target at that, those improvements until we really know the direction we're going. Okay, so it, existing, we're basically plumbed and electrical in. We don't have to, we're not going to have to do major work in those. I mean, $15,000 is not major work, but so we're really at, really I'm not saying bring equipment in. I'm saying like, you know, as an example, in my basement, I have a plumbed in bathroom that is not finished, right? It doesn't have any fixtures or anything in it, but it's ready for whenever we finally get it done, right? right? But that's what I'm talking about, that so in between 
but you, it sounds like we have to do a design work and decide warming or full kitchen and all of that, which we have not. We don't locations have. and also, um, you know, one of the things we we talked about at FAC is is really you're talking about some of the ceilings that are already open, you know, that we would go back in and have to redo. Okay. But, um, that number would be small compared to, you know, doing the program not knowing what to expect. We we wouldn't use that infrastructure for anything else other sure. than food service program. I think one of the other things, Melissa, that we're going to continue to look at as kind of an in-between is right now we have um, a cold option until we get to the full hot lunch. So right. we, we did take a, a step, although it's not the same as having a hot lunch. We're going to continue to explore if we do have to wait longer, what are some other alternatives that we might be able to bring to right. the school um, and that might not require us to have all this equipment where we warm things sure. up. Sure. So, talking with the food service provider that we get, can you, in the interim, maybe offer something a little bit more than what we're currently offering with that, that cold option? So that's one in between um, that we're looking at. I think what I've learned since I've been back the, the last two days is that um, the design work, really we would have to move ahead and pay for the design work right Full. now over the summer before we would get there in not having all of the answers, you know, the grease trap example that Darren used, you know, we don't want to pay to have uh, the design for all these grease traps only to, that we don't need, yep. right? And so um, exactly. we're looking at a couple of in-between uh, options, um, you know, in terms of lunch service and, and those things, um, but we will continue to update the board and if we can find a better option that bridges that gap, we will certainly come back. Sure, sure. I mean, you guys have a lot going on with the referendum, so, you know, the community voted on the referendum items, so, you know, hopefully we get those done. Yeah, and that certainly is on schedule and our priority. priority. Yeah. I think we also recognize, and, and I agree with what Steve shared in 2024, mm -hmm. you know, we are an anomaly in terms of a school district not offering our kids hot lunch, just like we were an anomaly not offering full day kindergarten. And, and so, if we can make that happen sooner, we will certainly uh, do that. Thank you. So then at this point, my intention is not to bring this up for a vote uh, next month. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I was trying to get his chair. That's why we needed, that's why we needed Kevin at the microphone. <laughs> yeah, one day I'll be out of the rolly chair. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's no problem. So I do not intend to bring that up. However, if anyone has any questions for me or for the administration over the next couple of weeks, please reach out and let us know. But with that, then that concludes my report. Is there any other questions? Thank you. Fantastic. And Todd has put a memo um, outlining all of this uh, in four docs this evening. Okay. Um, the district leadership team and the health and wellness committee have not met. But it looks like SASID did. So, Dr. Yeah, Russell? so we had a, another SASID meeting. Our next one is a week from Wednesday. And SASID is very much in the same process that we're going through internally as a school district in terms of what are our numbers going to be next year. Um, we need SASID to determine um, what their capacity is going to be, what they're going to be billing us so that we can bill out our budget. And SASID is not behind on that. They're waiting for their uh, member districts to submit all that. And so it's just this process that we go through in the spring and then fine tune it all the way uh, through in the summer. But really our focus right now is working with SASID to get final numbers on what their billing is go are going to be so we can finalize our budget and then determine uh, the services that we're going to take advantage of uh, our cooperative. Um, so things are moving along well. Uh, we do have another board meeting on the 17th and I'll certainly report the status after that meeting. Okay, mm -hmm. questions or comments? Everyone wants to see the game, so yeah. <laughs> we're keeping it brief. I brought it up, now everyone's thinking <laughs> of it. <laughs> All right, we have no discussion items tonight, so that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it is not intended to be a dialogue with the board. Um, issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or uh, addressed by administrative staff when appropriate. The board has allocated 30 minutes tonight for public comment. We ask that you keep your comments to three minutes to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. I have not seen any cards delivered, so I do not have any at this time. However, is there anyone here present today that would like to step up to the podium and leave a public comment? Okay. I didn't mean to intimidate anybody with the game. We're, <laughs> we're, we're perfectly willing to listen. All right, that brings us to approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revi uh, revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? 
If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the March 11th, 2024 meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the March 11th, 2024 regular meeting as presented. We have a consent agenda tonight. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and the financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary? So, so moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. We have a couple of recommendations for items uh, tonight, re recommendations for action. First up is the ELA curriculum and resource purchase. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of the benchmark 2022 as defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $828,070 for a six year adoption? Um, the purchase of UFLI or UFLI uh, foundational skills program at a total cost of $11,061.75 plus materials from Wilson Language in the amount of $106,252.50 and the purchase of Common Lit as defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $69,000 for a six year adoption. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of the benchmark 2022 is defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $828,070 for a six year adoption. The purchase of UFLY Foundational Skills Program for a total cost of $11,061.75 plus materials from Wilson Language in the amount of $106,252.50 and the purchase of Common Lit as defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $69,000 for a six year adoption. We have a gifted program delivery model. Is there a motion to approve the gifted education program delivery model to provide fourth grade gifted instructions to identified students at their own school five days a week in the 2024 through 2025 school year with the intention to replicate the model for fifth grade gifted instruction the following school year? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? Just one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, just I wanted more a comment really. Um, Kind of in regards to like the review evaluation process mm -hmm. as we look into this in future years and how what is you know are we getting the expected outcomes and things like this is pretty significant change to the way we're handling our gifted programming and i think um it's just important to kind of be sure that um the impacts it's having on the students obviously involved are we getting what we hope you know in terms of improvements to the program things like that um and also kind of how it's impacting the schools at large, um, you know, having it hosted kind of more in-house, so to speak, than mm -hmm. is more of a pull-out program. And I think, um, you know, especially looking at, are we seeing um, significant value in having it every day versus a one-day pull-out method and um, kind of the impact of maybe a fewer staff members who are involved in the program compared to you know a staff member at each building and what is the impact of that um you know you might be able to s there's potentially some argument to say that having more focused staff and having it be a pull-out program is providing a different level of instruction versus one individual at each individual school and training and professional development involved and just there's a lot of factors and a lot of variables going into it so just making sure that the outcomes are what we expect and that um, surveying families and surveying staff and surveying students involved and just making sure that the positive impacts are there for the changes in the program as we continue to roll it out and move it forward. I just think it's important to mention. No, we appreciate that and that is something that we've continued to discuss not only with the gifted committee but with our MTSS committee as well to make sure that we are achieving those outcomes and we have had preliminary conversations about surveying the staff members that are going to be asked to implement this as well as the families um, and to see how, and, and the students, of course, uh, to see how they're, um, you know, adjusting to the new program. Mm -hmm. And if for some reason this new program isn't delivering what we had hoped, well, we won't hesitate to come back and recommend changes and or a return to some of the things that we've uh, done before. Mm -hmm. Member Doshi. Just to one piggyback off of Member Hannes' comment and then a second comment. Um, 
around uh, evaluation, there, there's not going to be a group of students that will understand both models, right? This would be phased in to a new group of students. And so I wonder if there's an opportunity before the current students start to get phased out of the current model we benchmark against student experience as they're living and experiencing it today. Uh, only if it serves our evaluation plan. So I'd say build the evaluation plan first and then figure out in the remaining six weeks of school or so that we have left, what do we want to learn from the students that are in seat today to benchmark against future fourth graders and then future fifth graders and the future sixth graders uh, from the model. Uh, so piggybacking 100% off of uh, your comment. Uh, the second, uh, just, is, just a logistics question, how many minutes per day, says five days per week, but how many minutes are we thinking students will be pulled out? We're hoping that the grouping will be between 30 and 40 minutes per day, depending on scheduling, kind of staying consistent with what would be considered an intervention block for our students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a piggyback off your piggyback. <laughs> <laughs> so um, both questions interest me. So um, exactly what data in your mind would we be collecting to, to conduct our our analysis of, of, of implementation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I can Everyone gets to come to the party. Oh, yeah. okay. um, when we are looking at the evaluation of our programming, we want to see if logistically um, size of, of um, groupings is, is making an impact. We'll be looking at map data. We will be looking at IAR data. Um, we will be surveying the students on some climate questions in terms of their experience within the class setting, um, whether being in a um, pullout model at Puffer is um, serving them well and, and what are they getting out of the programming versus students who are experiencing that in their um, home school. What experiences are you having and, and what um, logistics are, are pros and cons to, to that type of programming. So we just want to make sure that we are being very thoughtful about the way that we roll out programming, ensuring that, um, as you shared, Member Hannes, that um, staff has ample opportunity for professional learning. They're collaborating with each other, that we're not having isolated um, instruction happening across the schools, that there really is a cohesive program that the students are being um, provided, and that we are supporting that through the curriculum office um, and ensuring that our staff feels supported. In particular, I think one of the numbers that we are going to, I think I know that we're going to look very closely at um, in our EPRA data is the um, students who are making high growth. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a number that we want to make sure, just as we concentrate with our interventionists currently on students that are below grade level, how are those kids that are above grade level, are they growing um, like we've predicted uh, they should in our EPRA model? That's another mm -hmm. thing that we're going to be looking at very closely. Do you expect them to make high growth? No, what, what I'm talking about, if, if I misspoke, is when we have students who are at or above grade level, identifying those students on our data and seeing are they hitting their projected growth targets, okay. are they going beyond that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because every student can make high growth no matter where they're yeah. at, but in particular, if we have a kid who's a grade level or two above, are they making their expected growth in the ACRA model? Um, because their achievement will, will likely always be there, but we want to make sure that their growth is there as well. And, and vice versa is true for students who might be below grade level, where the achievement might not be there, but the growth is typically there. Mm -hmm. Do we have benchmarks for that right now? Do we look at that for our current students that are in the program? So what we do for the, the students who are currently in the program is we will look at them individually and to see how they're doing. And, and so that data is, I don't want to say easily pulled, but we can certainly look at that as you were talking about for a benchmark group. How are our current fourth, fifth, sixth graders who are in that pull-up program how can we look at them um, to see where are those numbers? And then with our new model, are we seeing improvement? Are we not seeing the improvement? And those will be numbers that we're looking at. And that's disaggregated by school. So it's just going to each school, um, you know, choosing the students that are in the gifted programming right now and creating a small subgroup within um, the ACRA model. And something that coincides with the conversation that we're having here, the, the one impact I think this change has that could be potentially concerning is the difference in size of participation mm -hmm. from one school to another. So uh, what might work well at Leicester might not be something that continues to be uh, well taken at El Sierra, for sure. example, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think one of the things that we want to make sure, sure of is 
it doesn't necessarily have to be a one size fits all. So what can we do in, in, in making sure that I, I do have a concern that you could have a school that has two fourth graders or something in it right. that that Absolutely. met the gifted needs as opposed to a school like Leicester that may have three or four sections of fourth grade, mm -hmm. which would have a much bigger pool of kids. So I'd, I'd be interested in hearing how that's working when we have larger groups and smaller groups and, and any recommendations that might come up. Absolutely. About. And that was part of our decision to not change the evaluation or the um, identification process at this time because we wanted to see what using our current um, identification process looked like in terms of the programming and then making um, decisions based off of how that in-house model looked or in school, their homeschool model looked right. um, and then making some considerations and adjustments if needed um, to that um, criteria. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the gifted education uh, program delivery model to provide fourth grade gifted instruction to students at their own school five days a week in the 2024 through 2025 school year with the intention to replicate this model for fifth grade gifted instruction in the following school year. All right. Next up is the five year financial plan. Is there a motion to approve the financial uh, five year financial plan for 2025 through 2029 as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the five year financial plan for 2025 through 2029 is presented. Uh, next up is a student transportation contract. Is there a motion to approve a one year contract extension for 6.8% with first student for student transportation for the 24 25 school year? Second. Any discussion? Let's is please. It, oh, go ahead. This is more of a future thing. I'm wondering, uh, is there an advantage for us to do this in multi years, or do we prefer to do it at a one year, at a one year time? This is an extension. We have to go out and bid next year. That's mm -hmm. that's required for us. So, we once we're in a contract, we can extend it next year for both this and for our special ed. We have to go out, and that'll be a mul that'll be a multi year okay. uh, contract. And that again will be in coordination with. Um, 99 and 68. Makes sense. Thank you. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah, that's okay. exactly what I was going to say. I always like to let the taxpayers know that even though we have, uh, you know, separate school districts, we do try and act like a unit district to save the taxpayers uh, money. And this has been a very, very successful program that started long before I got here. But we do appreciate, especially our business managers who oversee this. And that's why when we get a lot of weird questions about why do these schools start at this time. These yes. that, that's why we all share the same pool of buses. It, mm -hmm. it helps out a lot. All right, any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve a one-year contract extension for 6.8% with first student for student transportation for the 24-25 school year. Uh, another transportation contract, special ed contract, is there a motion to approve a 6% contract extension for the 24 through 25 school year with Sunrise Transportation for Special Education Transportation Services? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Quite, uh, do you have a question for future purposes? I wonder, do, they, do these companies provide service level agreements and how well they do against their SLAs of like? These are the number of routes that we fully accomplish at 100% completion, and these are the ones that these are on time, on time rates and students that aren't picked up because that of driver is shortages. That has not traditionally been part of a contract for transportation. Uh, something we can look at, like especially that. as the state it's, asks it's us to get this out more frequently. I wonder if there's an opportunity <coughs> for us to. It's uh, not are, a. Are we in a are we in a driver's seat or a? No, whatever the it's, market it's, dictates. It's been about two decades since the transportation the transportation wars, where there was a turf war from one company to another trying to take over business. Yeah. Um, so it, it gets a little hard sometimes to, but we will, with the size of SASID, uh with all the districts and putting that together, I think we have some opportunities to look at, um, and and. Fortunately, um, my colleagues have been engaged, have kept me in the loop, and I've sat in on some of the conference calls 
that they've been sitting in with Sunrise when they were going through their contract discussion for their renewal. So I think it's something that we can we can certainly work on and, and look at um, in that aspect. And just to, to go a little further, I, I you know again I always want to be transparent. We are not in the the driver's seat when it comes to <laughs> these busing contracts. Um, I, would al I would almost yeah <laughs> almost use the term like we are sometimes at the mercy of the transportation providers. That being said, I want to assure the board and I want to assure the public that our relationship with first students, we do hold their feet to the fire when they are not performing the way they should be. Sunrise in particular, because they're transporting our special education students, many of which have significant need, we do the same uh, mm -hmm. there. One of the things that uh, the special education cooperative SASIT is really doing a better job of now that that organization is walking in a unified direction, because they too now are using Sunrise is really trying to get all the members of the cooperative um, together by next school year to accomplish that together. And so, because we're not in the driver's seat, what I'm alluding to is the more groups or the bigger your group, the more you start to control the dialogue, the more you start to control the services. And so, with first student, we don't experience a lot of the same issues that a single district would because we've got the power of the 99 consortium. Same thing can be true with Sunrise, with SASIN. Um, when you start to get 23 school districts working together, they're gonna to answer to you um, first. Now, with the companies though, I, I don't want to say that I think First Student and Sunrise are intentionally you know, delivering a poor product. I think in particular what they're facing is just you know, historic labor shortages, mm -hmm. which is really wreaking havoc on their system. It continues to get better, as we go through, you know, compared last year to this year, still not at the level that we would want in terms of always being on time, never having an issue. Uh, but most of the issues that we encounter are because of labor shortages. And I can assure you, Sunrise and First Student, most of the time we can't talk to a manager until five o'clock because their managers are covering and driving routes and, and, and things like that. So the more we can combine with other schools or search, the, the stronger we're going to be, and, and that is exactly the path that we've taken as a school district. I'll say, Karat, I, for my son who rides a Sunrise bus every day and has since kindergarten, not to say there's never issues or it's always perfect, but I've always found my interactions with Sunrise have been very good. I, you know, they answer their phone, they call us personally sometimes if they know the driver is running significantly late or if there's the oh you know there's a, a some sort of issue with pickup you're you know they're still at school they'll be you know a half an hour behind their normal schedule things like that and the drivers themselves have been awesome like really good people who really care about the kids and though like you said important for these are some of our you know mm -hmm. um most needy students and things like that and they've been great so i've had personally had a really good experience and i say it's perfect but I think it's, I mean, I've been very happy with Sunrise and what we've had over the years. Yeah, and the other point too is, um, you know, when they aren't delivering on the routes, so if their route doesn't run, we don't have to pay for that route either. So there are some consequences for that company if they fail to deliver the product that uh, they, they need to. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on that? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the 6% contract extension for the 24-25 school year with Sunrise Transportation for Special Education Transportation mm -hmm. Services. We have a resolution for the honorable dismissal of teachers pursuant to section 24-12 of the Student Code of Illinois, that's 105 ILCS 524-12. Be it resolved by the Board of Education of Downers Grove Grade School District Number 58, DuPage County, Illinois, that the teachers listed in the resolution attached under item 16F of tonight's agenda, posted on board docs, shall be honorably dismissed at the end of the 2023 through 2024 school year because of the decision of the Board of Education to decrease the number of teachers employed. At this time, I will entertain a motion to adopt the resolution regarding the honorable dismissal of teachers. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussions on this? This is never a fun part of the year, and it happens every year. Yes. Right. I always look forward to the following meetings when we when yep. we start sending those contracts right back. Yeah. back. And I can assure you, being a teacher and having my name on one of these lists, <laughs> and my wife was in the same boat, I think many teachers have been, uh, 
we do not take anything like this lightly and I want to assure the public and especially the individuals on this list that we are going to do everything possible to make sure that the registrations get done so we have a firm number of people so that hopefully in a month from now when we come back in May um, we'll be talking about rehiring um, a significant number of people that are on this list. Yeah, you stole my public service announcement. Please <laughs> register your students. Yeah, please Let's get them all. Students. Students. Please. Yeah. Well, I'm sure our yeah. numbers are really high tonight on uh, yeah. watchers. It is. <laughs> but again, we do follow up with those personal There's nothing really else on TV, I don't think, <laughs> tonight, right? Record numbers. <laughs> you want to know the score? Yeah. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> I will run out of this room. <laughs> Any other discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Number Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution regarding the honorable dismissal of teachers. Next up is the electric rates. Is there a motion to grant authority to the Assistant Superintendent of Business, the CSBO, to execute a new electricity agreement up to 36 month index adder electricity agreement with the ability to convert to fixed energy rates? Uh, so moved. Second. All right. Any discussion on that? All right. Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Number Hughes. Uh, the motion carried to grant the authority to the Assistant Superintendent of Business, or the CSBO, to execute a new electricity agreement up to 36 month index adder electricity agreement with the ability to convert to a fixed energy rate. Last up is the resolution for the dismissal of custodial maintenance employee for reasons other than reduction in force. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution uh, regarding the dismissal of the custodial maintenance employee for reasons other than uh, reduction in force? So moved. Second. Any discussion on that? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adapt the resolution regarding the dismissal of a custodial maintenance employee for reasons other than reduction in force. We do have a consent, uh, construction consent agenda tonight. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the construction consent agenda consisting of the items presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The construction consent agenda has been approved as presented in the Mackinac materials. A couple of announcements. A Tuesday, April the 16th at 7 a.m. will be the policy committee that will take place at O'Neill Middle School. And then uh, Monday, uh, May 13th at 7 p.m. will be our next regular board meeting, which will be right back here at Village Hall. Uh, we have no need, unless something's come up, for a closed session tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and skip that, and I'm just going to, well, unless, um, unless anyone wants to go into close to discuss the minutes from the March 11th, 2024 meeting. <laughs> Not me. You know, anyone that needs <laughs> to. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Then is there a motion to approve the minutes from the March 11th, 2024 meeting um, and keep them permanently closed for reasons of confidentiality. So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> the motion carried. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is carried. The meeting is now adjourned at 11.38 p.m.